Is the law of uh, Moses the same as the law of Messiah? Yes. So why does Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 say he is not under the law, that is the law of Moses, he is subject or within the law of Messiah, which he calls the law of God? Okay, so in verse 19, he says, though I'm free of obligation to anyone, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, that's people that kept Judaism, I hope that you understand that's separate than the commandments of God. I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though myself I'm not under the law, to win those under the law. Is that the law those, of Moses? Yeah, that's the law of God. And you, when you're under the law, it means that you've broken the law. So to, to simplify, because he's talking about evangelism here. And how he relates to different people. Is the, so, is the sorry, is the law of I'm just trying to question? I'm just trying to be clear here. Is the I law of God too. the That's law of Moses? Is the law of God the law of Moses? I just said yes already. So you're asking me the same question. Okay. I'm still Thank explaining you. your, my answer. Thank so you. those under the law become like one under the law, then myself I'm not under the law. Because he's saying I became like one under the law. To be under the law is those who are transgressing the law, who don't know the law, like Gentiles. He's talking about evangelism efforts here. Verse 19, he's talking about evangelizing those in Judaism. His former brethren, like he says in Galatians 1.19. Verse 20, he's talking about those he's evangelizing amongst the Gentile world who are still under the law, meaning they're transgressing God's eternal instructions and they're still under wrath. He says, I become like one under the law. Meaning I'm going to get down on the level and sympathize and talk to them. But he puts in parentheses, though I am not under the law, because why? He keeps the law of God, Romans 3, 30, uh, 3 and 31. He upholds the law of okay, God. He does so, not allow him to sin. Verse 21, to those without the law, I became like one without the law. Another evangelism effort of those who so, are completely ignorant of the law, like he talked about in different regions he went to evangelize. So though law, he, he so qualifies the, still and says, though I am not outside the law of God. So I'm, under, one, I'm under the law you. of Christ because... Let me I finish answering and I'll be done, okay? No, I got it. It's the same law you said. You're not got it because I'm not done. I got other Because questions. he says, I'm not I'm outside under the law of God. I'm satisfied with the your law answer. Of Christ. I may I may move on because I'm satisfied with your answer. I Thank see you. how this was I see I how it. this was working. I get it. I see. You don't want the actual answer whenever you're Well, I don't want you to 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 spend my whole, you know, time here. I'm not going to so spend your whole time. I was talking I'm about three different verses you asked me about. And then I'm moving on as as our moderator said. Thank you. Exactly. Uh, I see. I see. We, I wish we had discussed that rule before we started the debate. Well, she did say that. I mean, to say it at the point we started is not agreeing to it before we started. And I ask another question. I'm satisfied with your answer. Can I ask another no, question? My answer wasn't complete. But okay. I I am satisfied. It was complete to me. It was. It it's was not. Fine. It's Thank not you. complete. If you like cherry picking, then yeah, the, I guess it was complete. But if you want a full answer, in Galatians five, uh, Paul says, "But my brothers and sisters." Why am I still being persecuted if I am still preaching circumcision? Why did Paul say he was not preaching circumcision here? I've done an entire breakdown in Galatians. Uh, he's speaking specifically about the party of circumcision who preached the idea that you had to be circumcised to be considered part of covenant Israel. And that is not the first step in discipleship. This is what Acts 15 is talking about. This is what he tries to expound upon in Romans 4 and Galatians 4, or excuse me, Romans 4, with the example of Abraham, who had been following God for decades before he actually became circumcised. And he was still justified by faith and still a disciple of, of God before he became circumcised. And that's why he's talking about the party of circumcision in chapters 1 and 2 of Galatians. The same people that bewitched people away from faith in Christ, as he espouses in chapter 3 of Galatians, are the same people that he's saying, I'm not a, I don't preach that Judaism tenet, uh, that tradition of man, that you have to be circumcised to be considered Wait. in the family of God. Circumcision is a tradition of men. I just I'm said. Not I just gave you an. Ex I'll explain it again. So in Judaism, if you do some historical research on what Judaism teaches, the traditions of men from Judaism, they, teach they taught. Circumcision. I will tell. I'm trying to explain to you. They taught in the first century that you could not become a disciple of Christ and be, or you cannot become a disciple of Yahweh and be yeah. in covenant with Israel unless you You're first circumcised. got circumcised. That is not what the Bible teaches. That's, That's not, not what, what the Bible Bi teaches. Oh, hold on, hold on. What about Genesis what 17? Genesis 17 was 25 years after Genesis 12. Abraham had already been walking with God and following God before the command of circumcision came. Paul explains this in Romans chapter 4. I defer you to go check out Romans chapter 4. The law of physical circumcision is not a biblical law. Is that what you just said? I didn't say that. You're strong enemy. You're, you're misrepresenting what I said. I'm trying to understand what you're saying. I'll say it again. So, please. The instruction to be circumcised in your male member yes. was not your entryway into covenant faith with Yahweh. 
It, it is according to Genesis 17. No, it's not. It's a sign that you're already in covenant with him. I right. read and it if on you don't do it, it, what happens? According to Genesis well, 17. Let's let's ask uh let's ask Gershom what happened for 30 years while he was uncircumcised as a Well, let's husband. ask Genesis 17. If I may read, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, every okay. male among you, eight days I old. I read it earlier. Genesis 17, 12. Uh-huh. A slave who is born in your house. I read so it. So my covenant, if I may read. So my covenant, it's my time. I thought you were asking way. me questions. I didn't realize this you're is not a question. I'm reading scripture. So oh, my so you're preaching, covenant, you're not asking questions. I see. Could I please have my I, time? I thought you wanted an actual answer so you could be satisfied. I haven't on. asked a question, Sean. This is my You did. Time. I was trying to answer it, but you're cutting me off to preach. A slave who is born in your you're house. You're abusing your time, my brother. A slave who is born in your house, who is brought up with your money. Etc. So my covenant shall be in your flesh as an everlasting covenant. There's that word you really like. Everlasting. Mm -hmm. But as for an uncircumcised male, one who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. You're saying yep. that's not, that's from men? That's from a party of some what, men? You just read that a father has to circumcise his boy on the eighth day as a part of the covenant. And that instruction is being given to a group of men, one of them, Abraham, who's 99 years old, who had not been circumcised yet, but had been walking with God for decades before that. And he had to now, get circumcised. Let me, let me stay Thereafter. with you for a minute. Are you truly telling me that you don't think Abraham was justified by faith in God before he got circumcised? I'm reading the text that is very clear. Your, your after normal questions. These, I'm asking the questions. And after this commandment okay. by Yahweh God himself, not Moses, because you have yeah, an aversion a, to the law of Moses. This, this is, is why God you need an himself. open back and forth. If you're doing this question thing where you get to control the questions and then move have on you when I try to answer, this isn't Sean, a debate. This is how I have. Work. I'm Excuse me, gentlemen. Let's just keep it This is an abuse the debate. of the, of the debate I format. I said in the beginning we can move them along. I'm abusing I allowed my time. Sean to go longer here because <laughs> Carlos did there. Oh, my God. The person asks the question, the other one answers, and they can move on if we... But apparently I'm abusing my happens. time. I'm abusing yeah, my because time. Because I tried to give you an answer, I've never been and then you decided to interrupt me. And then decided to start reading scriptures as opposed to just hearing my answer out and being done with it. I've, right. I've done 20 plus debates. No one's ever told me you're abusing your time, Carlos. Okay, let's just have Carlos <laughs> ask the question, Sean answers, and if Sean gives enough answer and Carlos wow. wants to move on, he can. All right, next question. 1 Corinthians 7, 17, only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this way let him walk. And so I directed all the churches. Was any man called when he was already circumcised he is not become uncircumcised or do not become uncircumcised has anyone been called in uncircumcision he is not to be uh, circumcised circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing my question why did paul say do not get circumcised but you're telling me to get circumcised so in that actual passage that you're cherry picking and actually misquoting. So in this passage in verse 18, he says, was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. No one ever focuses on that part. Everyone just focuses on the cherry pluck of verse 17. Is this a, or, or, or the rest of verse 18? Was, was a man still uncircumcised when he had been called? She should not become circumcised because he's not talking about the physical commandments specifically of Genesis uh, 17. He's talking about the cultural tradition of Judaism to where they told you, you have to go through this certain rites and rituals in order to be considered in covenant faith, which is not scriptural. This, this is, there is no, it's impossible for a man to become uncircumcised. And I think you would agree with that, Carlos. A man who's already circumcised cannot become uncircumcised. So he's talking about a status this was they considered a cultural social status within their within their uh, first century Judaism, was if you were circumcised or not, whether you were of the Gentiles or whether you were in, uh, of the circumcised Jews, the Jews, the party of circumcision. This is a cultural status. So the point is, he clears it all up and saying that human tradition, cultural status nonsense is not re relative. All that matters is verse 19. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commandments is what counts. And God's commandments tell you to circumcise your children and yourself as an eternal command if you want to participate in Passover. Okay, I just read from the eternal command of circumcision in Genesis 17, so our viewers and our listeners can make up their own mind. Once again, though, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 18, 
if you are uncircumcised, do not get circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. And that's what the text clearly says. Romans 14, and I'll start in 19. So then let us pursue what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to let his eating be a stumbling block. My question, why did Paul say all foods are clean? Because food was defined in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and there was a ongoing debate amongst early first century Christians and Jewish people of that day about certain foods, specifically meats, becoming unclean for you and being bad for you. It was a part of the infusion of veganism that was a part of the ancient cultures that extended from ancient India. It was also practiced by Egyptians in the first century AD. I think a lot of this comes down to not understanding the cultural aspects of the first century discussions. And so this wasn't, this had not, this was about fasting and it's about fasting on what types of foods. Some were just eating vegetables. That's why if you read the context, Carlos, and the furthering down of Romans 14, he talks about eating meat versus eating vegetables and depending on your conscience, because they were arguing about what days it were to fast and what was best and what, what meats were considered good or bad. Food is already defined for us. Paul's already explained that. But he's telling the other people, if they're still new in the faith as converts and they're still coming from this bad practice of vegetarianism, which claimed meat was bad and made you unclean, then you would have to, you know, your conscience was weak and maybe not considering eating meat around that person. So it has nothing to do with negating the law of God in Leviticus 11 or Deuteronomy 14. It has everything to do with specific arguments about fasting, veganism, and calling something unclean that God never called unclean. Um, so when Paul says our foods are clean, he means those foods in the list of, of Leviticus. So yeah, all what those God called food. Okay. So it sounds like a tautology. It sounds like all clean foods are clean. Is, is that what you mean? No, I'm saying we, we have to go by definitions of terms as the creator gave them to us. And he already defined for us what foods we can eat and what are not, what we cannot eat. Right. So Paul here is saying all clean foods that you guys know from the Torah, from Leviticus, he doesn't he's have clean. to. He's already taught the Romans that he's discipling and writing a letter to. He already taught them the law of God. He already taught them what food is called food and what's not food. Well, I, actually, let me ask you this. Are you under the new covenant? Not yet. Not until the resurrection. Can you give me briefly, if you can, with, with my limited time, a, a verse or a passage I can where it says that? The introduction of it in Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34, where it talks about in this moment where you get a new heart and a new body, you want it to teach your neighbor. And it's expounded upon Hebrews chapter eight, verses 11 through 12. And then in 13, it says, but we are still, this, this covenant still waxing old until the new appears because the old covenant applies to mortal mankind in the mortal body. And that was still waxing old. Further on in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 through 40, the writer expounds on the mention he made in Hebrews 8, verses 11 through 13. And in Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, he says that we will all be perfected together at the same time. And that's the so, first resurrection event that happens on the day of the Lord. Is Jesus under the new covenant? He's been resurrected as a first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. And so, right. yes, he is in the new covenant because he has a new body and corruptible hearts with the okay. spirit and the laws permanently written on it. He'll never sin again. We'll be made like he, like he is at his appearing, as Colossians tells us. So currently Jesus is under the new covenant, but you are not. That's correct. Thank you for that. Because we go by the answer. definitions of, of the new covenant. Is the Aaronic priesthood olam forever? According to its context of prophecy, yeah, it's an eternal command to the descendants of, right. of Levi, specifically now through the Zadok lineage. That, and this is why Isaiah 66 says that at the return, that uh, God will choose new priests from amongst the Levites. This is in Isaiah 66, 17 through 21. So Jesus, how do you explain? I Jesus even read the probably? passage earlier from Ezekiel 44, 9, where he's talking about taking Levites back into his temple and they'll have a circumcised heart and flesh. Okay, so the writer of Hebrews, as you know, says that Jesus, you know, Jesus was not, according to the Torah, the law, uh, obviously, he's not qualified. He's from the line of Judah. He's system. not He's not a Levi. Right. So he's not qualified right. under that system. Do you agree? Right. That's why he's called a Melchizedek order priesthood. Right. He's in a different order. Right. So if the Aaronic right. priesthood is forever, Olam, mm -hmm. you like that mm -hmm. word. That's Jesus right. should be disqualified then because the God's laws no. should be followed forever, right? No. The very passage you're quoting from says in verse 3 that if Jesus were on earth, he would not be a priest. But he's not a priest on earth. He's a priest in the temple in heaven, as verse 1 and 2 of Hebrews 8 he tells you. He was a priest on, on, on earth. No, he wasn't. Hebrews 8, 3 directly disagrees with your statement, brother. 
Okay, so he appeared as high priest. It's Hebrews 9, 11. When Christ appeared as high priest of the good things having come. Okay. So he appeared in heaven, you said? Yeah, ver chapter 8, verse 1. Right, you know, the chapter before nine, because yes. that's we would read <laughs> chronologically. Um, Hebrews 8, verse 1 says, The point of what we're saying is this we do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, who ministers in the sanctuary in the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not man. So it already gives you the context of where he appeared as high priest. We have to read the whole story, we can't cherry pluck verses, my friend. Did Jesus function as? as a high priest while on earth? No. In other words, did he cleanse people? Did he heal people? Did, that's priestly. There's a specific definition for a high priest who functions in a temple ordained in a temple that's ordained and ordained in a position of priesthood. He did not get that until he got to the temple okay. in heaven. So, so Jesus is not a high priest according to the law of Moses. According so to Hebrews 8, 3, Hebrews he's seven, not a high priest on earth. So Hebrews he's a high seven, priest my in last the temple question, in heaven. if I may. So Hebrews 7, uh, 11, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, which is forever, Olam, for on the basis of it, the people received the law of Moses, what further need was there according to that system, right? And then verse 12, for when the priesthood is changed, so that eternal priesthood law was changed, of necessity, the law is changed. Do you believe that? Oh, <laughs> It's not talking about the entire law that's called eternal. It's talking about the instruction for the administration of a priesthood. Since the one on the ground's going away, that's why the fullness of time happened and he showed up so he could assume the priesthood roles as in the Melchizedek order in the temple above. The whole book of Hebrews explains this to you. And furthermore, the word perfection that you're using is the word for the resurrection. And this is where I would encourage you to study this out further. Verse chapter 10 of Hebrews goes into greater depth about this, about why it's considered being perfected at the resurrection, just like Christ was. And so this is why we're promised to be like him at his coming. We get resurrected in that glorified immortal body as well, and we're perfected. This is what Hebrews 11, 39 and 40 explains to you, which I, I quoted earlier. So this is the idea that, yes, the priesthood of the Levites on the ground was was prophesied to go away because it was prophesied that the temple would be destroyed and the Israelites be scattered again. And then the time of the Gentiles would start. And then at the return of Christ is when everyone's perfected at the first resurrection. That's only made possible by Christ in his priesthood position in the heavenly temple, which is what is espoused in multiple verses, specifically in Revelation 3, 5. He calls our name out before the Father and raises us perfected to eternal life. All right. It's a Thank you, gentlemen.